Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Essex Market. Essex Market is New York City's most historic public market, proudly located on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Find the freshest produce, meat, fish, and specialty foods from over 30 unique vendors. Learn more about the market's family of small neighborhood businesses at EssexMarket.nyc. This week on Meet and 3, we're looking at things that have changed and things that are still in flux. From mothers balancing new lifestyles to the social stigma surrounding pumpkin spice. You got rid of the star rating system and talked about, like, I'm not going to use the word ethnic when I talk about food. They recognized that safety was our motivation and, and they were very you know, receptive to the changes, understanding what we were trying to accomplish. A cupcake or a piece of bacon or a glass of rosé is not inherently gendered. Tune in to Meet and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host of Beer Sessions Radio. This is a special show. We're going to talk about Czech side pours and lagers. And uh, today is Tuesday. I believe it's November 17th, 2020. We're recording remotely. And check us out, heritageradionetwork.org. Become a member. So uh, the first part of the story is Mr. Chris Loring, uh, based out of Notch Brewing in Salem. Chris, how are you, brother? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So, Chris, uh, it, it's the side pour has been very popular lately. I believe that Good Beer Hunting and Ben Keen, they, they wrote an article about, about it. Um, and I'd never really heard much about it. About five years ago, I was at Notch with you, and it was the first time I'd ever seen the side pour. So tell us just a little bit about your Czech adventure, how you got into it, you know, and, and the basis of what the side pour is. Yeah, I, I guess it just stems from my travel to the Czech Republic. The first time I went was 2005. And there's a pub in Prague, um, the Golden Tiger. And I sat there and watched the bartender pour, I think it was nine or 10 half liters a minute off, off the uh, side pole. And I was just amazed at the speed, but also the dense, creamy head that was created in a half liter mug. And it was like the, the, the experience was like nothing I'd ever had in beer. Um, and that just kind of got me, you know, kind of enthralled with not only Czech lager, but also the dispense, you know, the production of the, the, the brewing of the beer is so important to them and how they do it and the processes they have, um, you know, decoctions requirement, mostly open fermentation, natural carbonation, long lagering times. But then the service of the beer is equally as important in its presentation and the way it's served. And so when we started Notch uh, in Salem, you know, we've been around for six years, but we started Salem in 2016. Um yeah, you know, we also do all the traditional brewing processes that you would find in the Czech Republic. We do triple decoction, we do open fermentation, natural carbonation, long lagering times. And I wanted to make sure the beer was poured with the same care and thoughtfulness as we did in the brewery. Um, so we, in 2015, I was uh, talking to Evan Rail and helping him, having him help me source the uh, Lucre Tower and taps because there was only one in the country at the time. I'm pretty sure it was Wayfinder that had it, um, and I was afraid of the language barrier, but um, 
you know, our rep at, uh, at, uh, at Lucas spoke, you know, pretty fluent English. I was able to, to um, you know, basically put the order in. We got a basically Luker tower and then four, four tap, four taps off the tower. And, um, yeah, it was, it, it was a challenge, you know, right away. I think everyone's going to say the same thing on the panel tonight is not only is it staff education critical and, and, and constant, but consumer education is constant too. Cause in the United States, we're all used to stadium pours that go up to the top, you know, don't, so it's really a different way to, to for the U.S. consumer to see beer poured with that amount of head, and there's a lot of education behind it. Well, I'll tell you what. I was just with you last month. I came down to Salem to visit you. And during COVID, one thing that started to bother me was that I've had so much beer in cans, and I've had some really good beer, but I really miss that mouthfeel. And, and in particular, the, the side pull, the mouthfeel of that beer made me realize, God, I just got to go to this kind of brewery or pub and drink this kind of beer all night long. Yeah, that foam really uh, adds to the experience. And that the way that's created is that the, most taps in the United States are kind of a piston assembly. It's on and off. Um, with the Luker tap, it's a ball valve. So you can restrict flow initially, and that breaks CO2 out of solution. That foam then goes through a fine mesh screen on a long faucet, long faucet. And so you know the process is to build the head up from the bottom. So you pour about two to three inches, uh, two to three fingers of foam. And then that ball valve goes all the way on to clear beer. And that beer is then poured beneath that, that, that head of foam and, um, you know, it, it builds it up from the bottom. So you have uh, basically the CO2 content of the beers maintained because you're, you're doing, you're, you're pouring straight non-foaming beer into the bottom of the mug, but that head that you've built on top is really wet and dense and not rocky. And so you're drinking through this really dense, creamy foam. And, and then it, on the back end, when you drink through that, you get this really bright and clean, sparkling, you know, Pilsner, if that's what you're, you're pouring. And the combination of the two are really wonderful. And you can't really recreate that out of a can. And I feel your pain. I've, drink, I've consumed a lot of canned beer in the last seven months. But luckily, I work in the brewery. And our, our tap room hasn't been open to the public, you know, since March. But, you know, that tap has gotten pretty good, pretty good use from the brewers and our staff. Because uh, we do miss it, we miss that experience. It's, it, it is it is singular, it's unique. You can't recreate it. Yeah. Hey, it, how much practice did it take to get the side pull taps functioning at your brewery with the staff and everything? Yeah, I really got to tip my hat to Pilsner Raquel because they really have wonderful YouTube videos uh, on educational um, uh, on education about how to pour. And so we lean on those a lot for our staff uh, to show them how how it's done correctly. But uh, once a quarter, we'll grab a keg and we will have our staff uh, just practice pouring. And then we have a competition um, for not only who can pour the best looking, but the most accurate measure. Cause you're going to get about, you know, it's just under, you're going to get about half a glass of foam initially. And then that, that dissipates and settles and as it settles, it comes up to a half liter line. So we use the check mugs that have basically, you know, two fingers of foam allowed and there's a half liter mark on that mug. And so, you know, the competition is like, all right, proper look, proper aesthetics, but also it's got to end up at the right measure. So we, we do constant training um, and we make it fun, you know, in, in so that we always uh, you know, have, um, you know, qualified staff and, and they know exactly what they're doing because it, it does take a lot of practice. You, you just, you're not good at it right out of the gate. It's, it's really the opposite of what most bartenders have been taught. You know, the faucet goes into the beer, you're creating a lot of foam, you know, it's just all these things that, you know, U.S. US uh, excuse me, U.S. bartenders just have not, not been taught. Well, one of our listeners, I'm sure, wants to come and taste all the rejects. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you pour a lot of beer when you're in training. Um, well, the training happens at like 10, 30, 11 in the morning, but we bring down some regulars and let them let them have some of <laughs> Some of the not, not up to standard pours. So how, how is the, I know you're a session beer specialist. I mean, I love your beers and thanks. Thank you. I was there a month ago and I had a full range, even your half of and all, all your German and, and kind of Czech inspired beers was off the charts, but tell us, talk us through your, your uh, lager lineup, um, whether the, the, your Czech or your German inspired lagers, what do you have on now? What do you usually have? And you know, how is it different for you selling them in cans? Uh, we, well, we've seen a lot more cans than we ever have because that's we don't have a lot of places to sell our beer right now. You know, our, our beer garden was open seasonally, and now that's only open on the weekends. We have not done any side, inside dining. Um, so we've put a lot of that into cans. So it's been fun because we've had a lot of lagers that normally are just over the bar, hit cans. But 
we typically have, when you walk in, we'll typically have three, three to four Czech lagers. And that's the only thing we serve through the, the Lucre faucets. We don't do anything else because we specialize in Czech lager. It's, like, it's easy for us to do that. And I mean, other beers can go through that and be wonderful beers, but just because we do have a lot of Czech lager, we'll, we'll just focus on that. So we typically have a 10 and 12 Play-Doh, um, uh, you know, four to four and a half percent uh, Czech lager. Um, and then we have then Polot Mave, which is amber lager, and then Tamave, which is dark, or Cherne, which is black. And we rotate those through the year. Um, and uh, you know, we also have an 11 Play-Doh uh, Czech lager as well. Uh, and then from the German side, we tend to be kind of like Bavarian focused in terms of uh, you know, Dunkel and Helles, uh, you know, basically influenced by the Munich brewers. And then we do a lot of stuff influenced by Bamberg uh, in terms of Rauch beer. Um, we don't do a lot of Northern style pills. It's, I think I find it a very difficult style to mimic because of the water treatment. Um, you know, but we, uh, we tend to make, you know, clean um, pale lagers and that, that tends to be our, our wheelhouse, but we make, you know, some amber and dark stuff as well. Um, and then once in a while we'll do, um, we do a Polish lager. Uh, this area that we're in in Salem has a large Polish community, so we'll do that. We do some American lagers as well. Um, and we're actually going to do, um, just this week, on Thursday, we're going to brew a, a French a French lager, which we never knew was a thing, which historically is a thing. It wasn't just a made-up thing. Um, uh, you know, the French were influenced by the German brewers and used French ingredients and French hops. But did the, what's that like a Cronenberg or something? No, it's, 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 it's almost lost to history because, you know, mass production kind of, you know, um, found, you know, basically pushed those beers to the side. They were, um, they were beers that had a cereal mash, a certain percentage of corn, about 20% were decocted, um, and then hopped to a stristle spout, um, and then used, uh, you know, French pills malt. So it did have some, you know, terroir, some regionality to it and some process stuff that was unique. Um, Chris, so, go, go, going back to Bamberg to uh, smoke yeah. beers, um, w- one of the beers I had last month, it actually just blew me away. It had, had the right balance and mouthfeel, even in a can. It was your Rauk Hellas beer. Can, yeah. Tell us about that beer. It's the first time we brewed that. Every time we've had that in the schedule, we've, we've kind of looked at each other. Brian Allen is my production manager. And we said, ah, we'll just make a Hellas. <laughs> With COVID, kind of all bets are off. And I think everyone on the panel probably says, yeah, we've done some things we probably wouldn't have done because we've had the kind of liberty to do so. Um, and so, I mean, that, that, I was in Bomberg last fall and, um, you know, I, I, I've heard both sides of how, um, Schlenker the Hellas is produced, whether it is done with rock malt or if it's just through process influence without rock malt to, 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 to bring out that, that smoke character. We use rock malt because, um, really wanted to have, you know, a certain character of it, character in it. And we just took our Hellas recipe, which um, we don't decoct. We don't decoct any of our Hellas because that's not our goal. Is not this deep melanoidin kind of character. Our, our goal is more of a clean, bright, grapey kind of character that we get through other methods. And we just, we just, you know, we just put in some some rock malt um, at a certain percentage that um, really balanced well. So I think we got a little bit lucky in our first try. And I think most brewers will say, yeah, we got you know most first recipes like yeah, you got ninety percent of the way there. We won't change a thing on it and. I think that's just kind of again through happenstance we got a little bit lucky with it, but we're really happy with that. I mean that the, the, a Hellas with a little bit of smoke in it is really wonderful. It's really just a great, great drinking beer. No, that that really was that made my fall. Um, you know, picking up cans at your brewery, uh, how fresh are those cans? Oh, within two weeks, typically. I mean, sometimes some beers will last a little bit longer depending on the style, but um, we 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 tip. Because of COVID, we've kind of d- changed what we're doing. We're, we're doing new all the time or rotational all the time and not just having, you know, six uh, beers that we do all the time because we need people to come. And the way people come is because they like new. It's the tyranny of new. But that's allowed us to do a lot of different lager styles over the, over the past seven, eight months. Um, yeah, so typically the beers, they're, they're a couple weeks old. And it's lager. It's not like it's a double IPA. If you get a lager that's six weeks old, you're okay. The beer's going to be okay. You know oh, yeah. Saying? And our, our listeners, I'm, I'm rushing Chris just because he's, he's going to leave at the break. But let's go through the – I don't know how you, you call them by number, but, you know, the Czech beers always have these numbers, 10, 12, 14. Take us through those. What do the numbers refer to? And then what are the beers that you have that match those numbers? Like I know you have a, a Czech 10 coming out. Yeah, so it's incredibly confusing to uh, most U.S. consumers. But you know, when you walk into a Czech pub, the beer that's consumed the most is a, a 10 Play-Doh Czech Pale Lager. And 
the, that is basically referencing the amount of sugar at the start of fermentation in real sim simplistic explanation. Um, and not the, not the alcohol content, the alcohol content can vary based upon attenuation and other factors, but that's how the checks are used to ordering, used to ordering beer, 10, 12, 14, um, even an eight. Um, and then it's then by, then by color. So it's, you know, a pale lager, an amber lager, a dark lager, and it's just based on that Plato or that strength. Um, so, you know, we just kind of took that cue cause we really liked that cause a 10 Plato check pale lager or, or, or Pilsner is a 4% really easy drinking pub beer. And that's typically what, what most pubs in the Czech Republic have, unless you're in the tourist areas. And then 12% is typically like the more like Budvar Pilsner Kell strength of, you know, four and a half to 5%. And there's differences. I mean, it's subtle, but they're there. Thanks so much, Chris, for joining us. We'll take a short break and be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. Essex Market is a food lover's paradise with over 30 unique vendors selling everything from one-of-a-kind spices to daily grocery staples and even scratch-made prepared foods. At HRN, we believe that buying from local purveyors is one of the best ways to support an equitable food system. That's why this holiday season we'll be shopping from the vendors at Essex Market. Not only are their offerings fresh and delicious, they're also affordable and sold by a community of passionate small business owners. This connection is what has made Essex Market a stalwart in New York City's food landscape for the last 80 years. Now located in a brand new building, Essex Market continues to be one of the most unique food experiences in New York. At Essex Market, you'll find Lower East Side locals shopping for plantains and avocados alongside visitors browsing freshly baked bread and locally produced cheeses. If this gets you hungry, order from one of the market's many prepared food vendors, serving up dishes from Peru, Thailand, Morocco, and beyond. Learn more and shop online for local same and next day delivery at EssexMarket.nyc. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'd like to introduce our guests. We had Chris Loring from Notch Brewing in Salem, Massachusetts, Todd DiMatteo from Good Word Brewing in Georgia, and Ben Benelis calling in from New Zealand. Start with Todd. How are you, brother? Howdy, Jimmy. I'm doing great. This is uh, Todd DiMatteo of Good Word Brewing in Public House in Duluth, Georgia. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. In Georgia. And Ben. Hi, Jimmy. It's been a little while. Um, ben Middlemas here from Ben Middlemas Brewing in New Zealand, and it's uh, certainly nice to uh, catch up with you guys again. Great. So uh, about a month ago, I visited Chris at Notch Brewing and, you know, mostly I'd been drinking cans like many people during the pandemic the last eight or nine months. And it was the first time I had draft beer in a while, but I didn't just have draft beer. I had uh, Notch Brewing's side pour, probably his pitch pitch lined uh, Pilsner. Um, and, and I realized the mouthfeel, it was something that I'd been missing. And I started talking to Ben. So let's go back to start with Todd. Todd, tell us, you know, what inspires you about lagers and why you guys put in a side pull at, at Good Word Brewing in Georgia. Um, so we've been making lagers since we started um, back in 2017. Uh, actually, we're about to turn three here in a few weeks. Um, yeah, the first thing we put out wasn't a lager. We knew we wanted something uh, pale and easy drinking and, and we could have before we opened. So the first thing we did was like a blonde ale. But after that, we're like, all right, we're always going to have, you know, something pale um, and balanced bitterness. And so after that, we started doing our pale lagers. And, you know, we early on, I was doing, you know, at least uh, Dietot, which is our uh, kind of house pilsners, 5%. Um, all Vireman malt with Sterling hops, which is my favorite uh, American hop. And we were doing a, um, a pale, or yeah, pale Mexican lager called We Used to Be Cool that has a little bit of corn in it and it sits around 4.6%. So those are kind of our mainstays. But I would make, uh, you know, Martzen and we made a, a Schwartz beer last year. And I think I made a handful of other things. But, you know, when COVID kind of came on, I was like, well, fuck it. I don't know how much. <laughs> how long things are in the tank. So I filled all our fermentation tanks with, uh, with lagers, uh, because I knew it'd be a while. Um, so right now I've got, 
five on drafts and I've got three in the tanks that I'm moving over for our anniversary and I've got uh, another on the list. But I mean, you know, my, what I tend, tend to drink is pale lager and, uh, you know, I like a nice bitter IPA. So for me, I'm, I'm definitely drinking and, and brewing selfishly. Um, but as far as the side pool goes, you know, we talked last time I was on about Brickstore Pub, one of the top five beer bars in, in the country for sure. And I think we might have mentioned Porter, which is also, you know, in my opinion, one of the best places around, definitely in the top five too. Um, they were the first, I think, actually I'm almost positive, Porter had the first side pulls. And so I reached out to those guys almost a year and a half or so ago because we were in Colorado and just tasting the difference, uh, you know, waiting patiently for these beautiful, frothy um pale lagers it just had such a great mouthfeel and uh so i reached out to nick at the porter and he connect, connected me with luker and uh wired them some money and patiently waited for our tap handle to show up and then uh as chris said watched a bunch of uh, pilsner Kell videos and uh educated myself first and then uh put that onto the bartenders to try to make sure that they were pouring it perfectly every time but it does it, it takes some practice to get it down for sure and you know, where we are, we're 30 minutes north of the city, so not as many condensed, like, beer people. You know, there are definitely some out here, but it was like, hey, listen, we have dietide dye on side pull, but you can also just get a normal dietide. And so from our bright tanks, I split the lines, and so now we have two side pulls. Now I have to make sure that I have one that I can pour quickly for service, and then for those who want it, it's listed on our menu, like, hey, this is how we lager, this is what we like to do, and if you're interested in you know, a nice frothy, less carbonated uh, version of these beers. You're gonna want the side pull. And honestly, our our staff and our regulars fucking love them. Yeah, Todd, you sent me some great lagers. Thank you. I had the Schwartz beer, the Martin, um, but the Die Todd Die. Um, that's what I'm drinking now. I really like that. Just tell us again what that beer is, and then I'm gonna ask you about the side pour version. So, uh, Die Todd Die, and if you guys have seen the can art, and Jimmy, I know you've got it. Uh, it's kind of an inside joke because, you know, people assume, like, oh, you hate this guy, <laughs> this guy Todd, and on the front of the label says, Todd's are terrible and they must pay. This is kind of an inside joke. We had someone on um, Untapped rate a, uh, a mild poorly and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what? Todd's a shitty name, even though that's my name. And I'm going to make a beard kind of mocking that. So it was in good spirit, I guess, uh, with the label, but it has Todd's dying all over the place, comically, of course. Uh, but this is this is all um, Bohemian floor malted Pilsner uh, malt from Byron. Um, a little bit of acidulated. And what I do is uh, I step mash the beer. Um, so it's super well attenuated. It has, uh, you know, great lacing when you pour it in the glass. Uh, it finishes low as far as um, the Plato goes. It's like 2-1, I think, finishing gravity. It ends up being 5%. I use Magnum to bitter it. And then uh, I do a later uh, hop addition of Sterling, which is American uh, Noble Hop. And like I said earlier, it's one of my favorites. And it's just a super crisp, clean, easy-drinking Pilsner. Um, I love it. I've got yeah, die yeah. Todd die, and that's also the play on the German uh, like der die das, right? The well, yeah, die Todd D. I think it's the female version of die Todd that are D. D Todd D. Yeah. Hey, I was going to ask you. Chris was mentioning that the side pour is a faster pour. I mean, did, did, does that come into play at your place when it's, when it's not COVID? Uh, so so how is it faster? What what makes it faster? Well, so like he mentioned earlier, you know, you, and so this is something I was, he had such great knowledge too, by the way, Chris, uh, you know, I wish we could have um, talked a little more, but man, I'm very impressed. I can't wait to try your beer at some point. Um, but even with our normal taps, I always try to get our uh, bartenders to do like a little back pour to create a little bit of foam and then pour through the foam on the ones that aren't side pulls because you get that foam cap and it protects the beer all the way through. So you have like no ox oxygen getting into there. Um, anyway, it's a little like cheat way to do it. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, he mentioned, you know, it's not a piston and it's a ball valve. So if you can imagine like going from, you know, full on close to wide open, there's definitely a skill set to getting that foam 
the way it needs to be. And, um, you know, basically you have like a little screen that helps, you know, degas that thing as it's coming out. So you build this huge billowy head and then pour through the foam. Um, it's funny too, because he also mentioned, um, uh, the beer or the tap stays in the glass, which is one of those things like coming up at a place like brick store pub, that's like world-class beer bar and having the uh, tap panel even touch the glass, is like a huge no, no. Um, and we've definitely taught that to our bartenders over the last, you know, three years. But when I was like, no, it's fine for this, you know, you, you, you dip it in and it, it's, it's part of the whole thing. Um, but it definitely makes a difference. And what I would do, and I don't know if the bartenders are still doing this with a lot of folks, but I would like ABM, like, Hey, this is diatide coming off, you know, straight off our normal piston tap. And then this is off a side pole. And it is remarkably different. You know, what's funny is I almost crowded you up a side pull version of die Tide die just to see if you could like take, I was just like, I don't think it would, <laughs> I don't think I could get it in the, uh, in the can, but maybe a growler would have worked. Yeah. And that, who knows if it would ship too. Hey, um, l- let's get, um, Ben on a uh, Ben. I used to call you Steve, Ben, Ben, Steve, Middlemas. Um, <laughs> it's great to f- get back with you. And, and we were chatting, I, I guess you had joined in the last time I mentioned about the side pool. Um, you want to give us a little, uh, technical insight into what we're talking about? Yeah. Well, um, I think this, you know, the side pool valves an interesting sort of a, uh, dispensing, uh, unit because it's essentially, a, um, a a swept up version of a of a ball valve, which is a fairly commonly used valve in household plumbing, I guess to a degree. Um, but because of the way the ball valve operates, um, you have a a, a completely closed off uh, section when there's no beer coming out. But when you start to move the lever around uh, a few degrees, you have a, um, a, you open up a small part of the, the big uh, hole which goes right through the middle of the ball and so you create a, a reasonable degree of turbulence initially if you only open the valve a little bit so you'll create quite a lot of um, foam by, uh, by that process uh, and still have a reasonable control over the amount of flow that's coming through that only partly opened orifice that's in the valve and then of course, you're creating that nice uh, foam, and uh, which you're getting in your glass, and you also you are breaking out some of the the gas which is in the beer to soften the beer back a little bit. And, and if you open the lever right up to the 90 degrees, which is fully open, then you just have full flow of beer because you've you've essentially opened up the full hole that's, that's bored through the middle of the ball, and so the beer has has the maximum uh, ability to flow. Um, and that, of course, that depends a little bit on your gas pressures and things that you're pouring on within the pub. But I can see how that could uh, be ideal for certain styles of beer, um, and especially the lagers, which are traditionally produced within uh, Europe because of their age-old methods of uh, basically this is the carbonation process, which is... Um, you get a much better bonding of the carbon dioxide within the beer from the natural uh, conditioning processes than you do from the tendency from a large amount of breweries these days, including here in New Zealand, uh, where we force carbonate the beers after filtration, perhaps, um, to just make things easier to process. But but by doing that, you tend to get a much larger, larger bubble and it tends to break out more readily where you have the if you have the naturally carbonated products that are done over time the the carbonation bonding is much more stable and so you get uh, a a lovelier softer mouthfeel in the beer and a lovely rich long-lasting head no no because trouble is when your beer if it if it um uh foams up a bit uh, during processing from artificial carbonation and and uh, it's hard to be avoided to a degree sometimes uh, that that each time you foam before you even sell the beer you're you're losing a lot of those um, a lot of the ability of that beer that you have remaining to be able to produce a proper foam because a lot of the proteins that were used that formated the head have or have been used uh, spent 
basically more or less and so you don't have them available for uh, for when you're actually dispensing the beer to the public so the, the, the gently you can be with your beer and retain as much of those uh, head formation proteins too in there that you can maintain in the beer before dispensing and uh, you'll you'll have a much better pour and a nicer looking longer lasting head on the beer uh, at the final point of sale so ben hold on one second so todd did you get that uh, i do we actually um i spun all of my loggers whether they're you know pill loggers or not um i don't know if you guys are familiar with a spunning valve but that's basically yes 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 yeah, so, so you're you're carbonating through the fermentation process yeah, exactly. So a lot of people will, you know, plug that on when they're a few Play-Doh out. But what I found is uh, usually three day, two, three days in, I connect my spawning valve and, uh, you know, set it to 0.8, you know, just under a bar and yeah. let it go until I'm satisfied. And I use um, – our house yeast is a pretty robust neutral um, yeast. It's a German eye angry. It's a it's, uh, Bach yeast. Yeah. Um, I've used a handful of other ones, but man, I just, I know I can trust that yeast. It's not a dioxide producer, but, uh, from spunning natural carbonation, our beers have been markedly better. Our lagers, I should say. Yeah. Uh, we only have two of those. So it does tie things up a little bit. Um, so I usually have two actively going. And once I move one to, uh, you know, cold conditioning, I'll pull it off and then I'll put another one and, you know, move it around. Um, but I love those things. I know a lot of folks will take their uh, PRV, a pressure relief valve, and just set it to you know 15 pounds or, or, mm. or just right around one bar and then connect it that way. But uh, you know, with us, I typically only have about two to three in the tank when we're like in regular production. Like I said, you know, over COVID, we had uh, bumped it up. But you cannot be spunning a lager. It's it's amazing. It's a huge difference. The mouthfeel, like you said, is. Yes. Uh, more, more malt character. Uh, I don't know. I live and die by spawning beers for sure. <laughs> Let's go back. Ben, um, just some processes that Chris was talking about. What is triple decoction? Uh, well, that's the uh, that's the uh, long, drawn-out process, which most brewers tend to try and avoid. I know why they did, originally did it in Europe to uh, – um, for in decoction mashing, it was uh, when the grains, uh, the barley's they produced, or sorry, the the malt that they produced, etc. In the old days, sometimes was uh, it's not nearly as good then as it was as the process as they use today. The malts are much better modified, and they are you do get a lot more yield out of the malts than they used to. And in the old days, they used to use processes which have still remained tradition in places where they. Um, you know, the decoction mashing for the heating, uh, for different steps for, for protein conversions within the mash for uh, during the brewing process, they would remove a, a, a portion of the mash away from the mash tun and then put it in an area or either in the kettle or a vessel specially designed um, that they could boil that entire part of the mash. They get it to boiling to a boiling level, and then they'd reintroduce that back to the original mash, and they would use that heat created from that partial boiling of the part, a little part of the mash, uh, by mixing that back into the mash tun. That could raise the uh, temperature up further and further. So that by doing that two or three times, they could raise the uh, take take the entire mash temperature through a range of uh, of steps of uh, temperature increase and uh, uh, for the different conversion factors that would happen with the enzymes within the in the malt, um, but by doing the boiling process as well, it tend to break down some of the grain, and uh, you you get some of the grain flavour coming back into the the overall product. So that's why some of the the decoction beers out of Europe have a rather uh, quite quite pleasant actually, and a lot of them, especially Dortmund and, and a few different beers, that have quite a a grainy character in them from that process. And then, Todd, um, I read that the side pour it is attempt to mimic a, a gravity pour. Do you guys have any gravity pours at Good Beer? Good, yeah. good word brewing, excuse me. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, so we have um, – I do cask, uh, cask condition um, beer as often as I can. We do typically the, the pin cask, which I think those are – 4.5 or 4.8 gallons 
Um, we always have on a, um, a mild and a bitter. And right now I've got two that are conditioning warm. I have, uh, what is it? The, uh, I call it analog life. It's a 3.6% dark mild that I made recently. And then I've got uh, digital comfort, which is a 3.9% best bitter. Those are both conditioning warm, but we, we don't, I'll gravity, I'll, I'll, um, you know, use a little, uh, the shiv, I forget what you call the thing. I'm sorry. Um, on the bar top, if I have more than one cast going, but we have a beer engine. So we usually only run one, but come coming up for our anniversary, I'll have two casks on. But, um, I mean, it's pretty soft, but I mean, it depends on how much sugar you're, you're adding as a brewery because, you know, you're conditioning those, um, depending on like, all right, I have this beer at 55 degrees to drop the yeast for, you know, one day, two days, three days, or even a week or more. So there might be less yeast in suspension. And so the amount of grams that you're using for um, sugar to, to carbonate that, it might it might be like 1.2 atmospheres instead of like 1.4. So I don't think that the side pool is getting that soft as far as carbonation levels go. But I mean, you know, our, our Pilsner is... Uh, usually 2.5 or typically, actually, I would say it's probably closer to 2.6 um, uh, volumes of CO2. And I don't know where it softens it up with the side pull. It's considerable, but I'd still say it was, I don't know. It's not that low. <laughs> it's definitely not down in the one for sure. So you, you just made me think about something. So for Ben, we're talking about mouthfeel. So what is mouthfeel? Is that about how you, about measuring the carbonation? Oh, it's it's a number of things. I guess it's uh, mouthfeel can be affected by um, it's the fullness that you feel in your mouth. I guess, and that can be a little bit of uh, of the hops that are used, the style of hops, the uh, that help to give that impression. But it's the the, the actual body of the beer, that the amount of uh, body it's in the actual product, and um, and also some of the carbonation. Uh, uh, that's breaking out while you're drinking um, the beer, and it helps give a uh, a, a nice fullness uh, in your mouth. If it's if it's a beer that has a very like a uh, a low-bodied beer and low carbonation, they tend to taste quite flat, and they don't do much when you you drink them. It's almost like drinking a a glass of slightly bitter water. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the mouth feels uh, a lot to do with the. Uh, the carbonation that's kept in the, the body of the beer and I guess that is is better you get a better mouthfeel with beer with beer that has been carbonated in a more um, uh, stable way where the where the gas bubbles themselves are, tend to be much smaller and finer and give a give a closer the head forming from that is a more creamy um, yeah, closely cropped sort of a head that you get from the beer. Great. And then, Todd, let, let's go back to uh, canning. Uh, you know, we can talk about side pours for a long time. Um, what are the challenges you face with canning? I, I know you had a, you threw some beers in the crawlers for me, um, but are there technical challenges that you find with canning? And that do you feel that during COVID, are you missing, uh, you know, having beers on draft? Um, so, you know, so for us, we're open uh, inside. We've taken out about 12 tables. Um, but our space, and hopefully one day you can see it, it's, it's really big. Um, we have a huge outdoor, uh, space. So we're open inside and we're able to do draft. Um, and yes, crowlers, I hate, and I hate is having to send you crowlers. We actually just got our canning line, uh, not quite a month ago. And so I did do a run of die tide, like literally two days after I sent that crowler to you. And I was like, dang it. I wish I could have sent them this, but I just want to make sure you had it in time, blah, blah. But, um, you know, still dialing that in, but I mean, our anniversary is on uh, November 28th and I have seven cans to, uh, to make sure that are just perfect. And there's definitely challenges with that. You know, you have carbonation levels, uh, the, the bright tanks being cold enough, um, you know, the foam, uh, coming out and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I, I love it. I, I I'm, de I definitely love beer and cans. Uh, at the house, but like Chris mentioned, and maybe you brought it up to uh, having that side pull at the bar and being able to just drink a lot of them, uh, which we did in at Beer Stop in uh, Colorado. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those things that like there's a lot of romance and 
that goes into it. And drinking a can, it's kind of like, you know, hot and heavy. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a reason to go out. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I think I first got turned on to draft beer about 20 years ago. What are some other places that you mentioned one? What are some other places that you know are doing side pours? I'm going to shout out to near Albany, New York, um, Delaware Supply. I was just introduced to them. They're doing at least one side pour. What are any others that you know of? So Modern Draft is who is the U.S. Um, rep for Lucre. Um, those guys are great. I think I talked with the owner, Christopher um, Trywell, I believe his name is. But Modern Draft, they're awesome. You can order your side pulls from those guys. But like I said, here in Georgia, the first folks were um, the Porter, then the Brick Store, and then us. Um, I believe – I think Halfway Crooks has some. Those guys make amazing lagers, too. Um, But, yeah, man, I don't know who else has any in the state. I mean, you know, the thing is, and I kind of joked about it the last time I was on the show, a lot of times you have brewers who are just focusing on the one thing, and the homogenization of craft beer is this fucking hazy IPA and, uh, you know, fruited sours and and big styles with stuff in it. And, again, we Good Word makes all those, but I feel we – legitimize that in a big way with making uh super quality lagers um but i think i think more and more uh people are starting to realize that we're getting palate fatigue and social hype fatigue and all these kind of i don't know i think that we're uh we're all realizing that we're just missing pale logs and side pulls in our life well, we're also missing hanging out in good, in good breweries and, and bars. And I want to give a big shout out, shout out to both you at Good Word Brewing and Chris Loring at Notch Brewing for, for staying open through this pandemic because it's really disrupted our norms. And uh, just uh, realizing how much I want to drink straight out of a side pour is uh, keeping me going. Um, so, Ben, let's go back to canning. So canning technology. Um, what's the issue? So it's is what what are shortcuts or just just mistakes that happen with canning um particularly about carbonation and any other issues that can come up um well some of the issues i've seen um with the can some of the canning lines that are around uh i guess um i always get nervous when i watch uh, most cans are open filled of course and um it's okay uh, as long as you can get the keep a lot of CO2 or a bit of foam around the top of the can by the time you put the the seam on or the the, the lid on the can. But sometimes I have a feeling that there's a a, a delay but too much between the time the beer is finished filling the can and then the actual seam is applied. And uh, I've seen in various tests on different beers um, uh, with with, uh, using dissolved oxygen meters uh, which is, of course, this, what our biggest enemy is with uh, packaging any product, and especially beer. Um, it leaves uh, spoilage prematurely and and unpleasant uh, flavours in a very short time after you've gone to all the trouble of making your wonderful product and then upsetting the apple cart when it comes to packaging time. Um, but the oxygen air, that it's amazing. We were doing some tests, and even against, uh, we had one of the hoses, one of the feed lines feeding the uh, the filler that had a very, very small leak in it, but it was a pressure leak. So in other words, what I meant, beer was actually coming out of there so uh, uh, through this tiny little leak, a very small amount of beer. Um, but I thought at the time, well, that won't be such a problem because it's a positive leak. It's beer trying to come out. We just want to stop that leaking. But the actual effect... Uh, the amount of oxygen that was still getting into the beer, even against the positive pressure, but it absolutely amazed me. And we were measuring downstream from the leak, and uh, with the uh, dissolved oxygen meter, and we saw a very high increase in oxygen levels to, through the roof until we stopped the actual positive leak. And I wouldn't have thought oxygen would have got in through the hose against the pressure, but it did very easily. So uh, that is one one concern with uh, uh, some of the uh, places I've seen with some of the canning lines have a large number of connections and possibilities for oxygen entering anywhere, really, uh, during the packaging process. So that's one problem that is uh, always ever present. Um, the other, I think, 
some guys may have been trying to um, raise the carbonation levels in their uh, beers and their products to try in the effort to try and perhaps uh, fight off some of that effect of uh, oxygen uh, uh, entry into the product during during the canning process to try and make their product last a bit longer. I think through COVID has caused a few problems, obviously, with the draft outlets being closed and people relying on, on takeaway product. Um, and a lot of that product, I think, has failed uh, in a shorter time. And uh, there have been people that have bought product and it's a canned product uh, and, and possibly some bottled product too, which has actually not lasted the, the distance. Um, you know, some of the... Uh, uh, supermarkets here in New Zealand, for instance, they uh, they advertise their all, all the shelf products at a uh, year a year shelf life, um, and uh, any brewer realizes that uh, you are really pushing your luck for something that's sitting out in the shelf to last more than a, a, a couple of months, really. Especially if it's a fire, a really nice product, it's not going to sit there unrefrigerated and uh and last the distance so that, that that that's also a concern too but yeah there are some products out there unfortunately that have possibly been over carbonated in the pro in an effort to try and make them last a bit longer in the packaging process but have also undergone um slightly dubious uh packaging practices where they haven't been able to do it in a nicely uh a nice efficient way where they can reduce those elements down to an absolute minimum and because it's quite disappointing as a uh, as a producer if you you do put you know you're very passionate about your product and you go to so much trouble in every single facet to make sure that that product you produce for sale is going to be fantastic and then suddenly at one at one foul swoop at the at the point of uh, packaging it you can you can completely undo all that good work you've done well, Ben, that's a good point. And for Todd, you know, it, it, it seemed like the conversation that most people had during COVID was, oh, there's a higher demand for cans. We're not getting in the aluminum or the cans themselves. But I would think from listening to Ben that the real issue is uh, a lot of uh, like manufacturing producers and, and metal work shops that I know have turned to producing uh, canning systems. And I, I'm sure that there's some variation in the quality of these systems if everyone's trying to knock them out. So what, tell us about the system that, that you, you guys put in. And if you don't mind telling us where it's from and any research you had to do to, to really figure out what was the best system for you. Uh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, as a brew pub producing less than a thousand, uh, barrels uh, a year you know it's not like we have a great need for a canning line like obviously having cans and being able to put the beer in package and, and get it in people's hands outside of these four walls is is huge um but anyway it wasn't really on our radar but um wild goose released i want to say it was in late january uh a unit called gosling and they promoted it as like having the same technology like this um underfill technology they have in their bigger systems and the uh, CO2 blankets, all these sorts of things. And the price point was like 28 grand. And so I'm like, well, shit, this is something we could probably pull off. And so we actually work with a, 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 a group doing like white label uh, beers. I make beer specifically for this company. And so they were getting charged a canning fee because we were using mobile canning. And I was like, well, you know, if we, <laughs> where to buy this canner we could do away with that fee and so they were like okay cool we'll do this and so we were able to get a you know thirty thousand dollar canner which is very uh minimal as far as canning line goes anybody with a big system will tell you that's nothing pennies um so anyway we we went to order this and i did all the paperwork we didn't have the, the uh, money from uh from the yet until right around covid and it went from like one to three weeks for like um, production for the system to four months. I fucking kid, I kid you not. Four months is what I was quoted when we actually, I paid all the money up front. Like, you know, here's the whole uh, sum, yada, yada, yada. And uh, they said at one point they were selling a hundred of these units a week. And I'm like, good Lord. Um, 
but it took us almost five months to get this machine. And I know other breweries and I'm you know, not bemoaning the fact, you know, it is what it is. And they told a lot of these and um, the wait times have gotten pretty long. You know, it's, it's one of those, like, I was definitely getting pretty perturbed, to be honest with you, with our wait time. But it's like anything else. Once you have it, you're like, all right, well, well fine. We, we have it in house now, so I'm not going to keep, keep bitching about it. But I mean, there's another brewery. I won't say who it is, but they're still waiting on theirs, and it's been seven months. Um, what they told me, and it just sucked, you know, because it's it was really like I said, it was released before COVID, but it was a perfect price point for so many uh, small breweries and brew pubs to enter this canning world. And kind of what Ben was talking about, like you know, you can you can probably pull off a twenty to thirty thousand dollar canner, but it's not like you can drop a ten thousand dollar the twenty thousand dollars on a, um, a dissolved oxygen meter to make sure that you're putting out quality product. For us, we're lucky because we have other breweries around us that have you know have those uh, in their facilities. Come over to check our levels on um, cans and bright tanks and stuff like that. But it's not easy. I mean, getting into packaging is it's it's a whole other ball game. You know what I mean? And and for us, we're so small. <laughs> you know, it, I don't know. I'm always always eager for us to like grow and do cool things but i'm also like are we biting off more than we can chew because i mean there is one person in the staff that uh good word brewing that works in the brewery and that's me you know so it's like always you know, always have to like mitigate things that i'm willing to take on but um anyway definitely happy with the canner uh now that we've gotten it but you know it was a long wait and there were times when i was like we're still closed down and doing a soup kitchen. And I was like, are we going to fucking make it until we get this canner in that could actually save, potentially save our business. But anyway, that's probably a little dramatic on my, my part. Um, but anyway, we made it and we got a canner. Well, honestly, it's, it's more people that probably want to hear more about that than they do about dissolved oxygen. <laughs> but it, it, it does matter because at the end of the day, that, that one can I get can make or break my day. And especially being at home when, when I'm out somewhere, you know, there, there, there's the fun and the vibe and you you know your pub and, and you know who's pouring good beer and you're going to try some different beers. But when I'm at home and however many beers I bought, I bought four, I bought six, you know, if, if that beer is off. I'm screwed for the night, you know, and a lot of places where people live, especially now with the restrictions, sometimes those, th that store to get a good beer or a brew pub might be closed, you know, after a certain time of night. And then let's go back to Ben. Ben, catching up with you, man, like, I don't know, five or six or seven years ago, you Bye. were on Beer Sessions. <laughs> yeah, Beer <laughs> Sessions Radio wrong. with some of the Shelton brothers, and you had been making the, the Hanson, the band, the family, had a brewery in Oklahoma. So... Let's not talk about that, but tell us what, you know, what you're working on in New Zealand. Are you a consultant? Are you uh, making beer at a brewery? What, 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 how do people know Ben Middlemiss? Well, I've, I've been, you know, I guess I'm, I'm one of the pioneers in New Zealand brewing. I started here um, back in 1992 here in uh, commercially uh, in New Zealand. Um But since then, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I, I ran my own brewery, uh, uh, company with uh, uh, several pub outlets that were part of it. Um, but since then, I've been um, helping people in different parts of the world with their breweries, troubleshooting, uh, yes, consulting. Uh, and more recently, um, I became involved in New Zealand's first uh, brewing school, which was set up down here in the South Island, quite uh, down in what, an area they call Central Otago, which is a very beautiful area very not far from Queenstown which is a very popular area here for tourism which is a little bit unfortunately affected at the moment from COVID um, but the brewing school has taken on uh, this is its second year with uh, uh, has said uh, several students come through and uh, graduate with a diploma in brewing so we take them through from all the theory and we have a lovely little uh, brewery which we can brew about uh, uh, in I guess in American terms it's about uh, uh, five or six barrels at a time um, and we're getting this more equipment arriving but they the students brew a lot of equipment a lot of uh, different styles of beers we teach them the basic styles and the and the, the proper way to make them and then we tell them if you want to go and get into the crazy crazy beers that are out there at the moment well that's up to you you're welcome to do it but we want to learn how to make proper the normal 
uh, traditional beers first. You need to have a grounding and all that first to know before. Once you know all that stuff, well, then of course you can go out and the world's your oyster, and you can you can make what you like. And so we're pretty proud of some of the efforts that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, those guys have put in, and the young guys and uh, and young ladies too are learning, um, becoming uh, very good and proficient brewers. So uh, that's a very satisfying thing to help to to put some effort back into the industry because. Uh, I hate going anywhere in the world and finding bad beer. It doesn't matter where I am because, um, you know, that there's a lot of people out there putting a huge effort into making good beer and it's a bit unfair on them that there are elements within the industry that perhaps need to um, have a look at themselves and how they're producing their product because it can create bad image uh, imagery in, in the eyes of uh, newcomers to craft beer and uh, people from visiting from other countries. I think it's, if you're going to be in commercial brewing, do it properly. You know, there's, uh, everyone would like to see everyone making decent beer, I'm sure. So, Ben, I'm, I'm an idiot when it comes to brewing. I'm coming to your school. What's the first thing you're going to teach me as a beer fan, but someone who really doesn't have any technical understanding? Um, well, we do like uh, students that... Uh, that are enrolled to have some at least a basic background in science and stuff so they can understand you know because we do go through uh, all the processes within barley and why what barley does and how it becomes malt and um, we you know we're very fortunate to we, we the school is only within about five hours drive of a, uh, a very a, quite a large maltings here in New Zealand where malt is produced and we can take the students through there to see malt basically starting from the barley from the from the raw grain through to the finished product including roasted malts as well so so that's that they find that every student we've taken on that visit have absolutely loved that part of the course because it's uh, they can see they can see the barley growing in the fields and then they can see it turning into something which makes which becomes part of a of a nice beer and uh, and the maltings even has a small brewery in it so that at the end of their uh, uh, product some of their tests are done on their own malt by producing uh, some very interesting beers which they have on tap within the offices of the of the maltings so we can we can try everything from the raw grain right through to the a beverage which is produced all on site from from out of the ground and into the glass um, so that's always a good thing. So we try to teach everyone that, to make it very interesting. We have very interesting audio visuals and we, we go into all the chemistries of what goes on within brewing and yeast uh, and hops. And uh, so we try to keep it so that you, know, you can learn. It's not, it's not beyond anyone's uh, ability to learn. And um, it does uh, make the whole process by the end of it. They, they've got a good handle on the... Um, they walk away from here at the school with a good handle on the technical side of brewing and why things happen within beer and why we do what we do. And then, of course, the the fun part too is them making beer on the equipment on on the uh, on the commercial uh, brewery uh, and being able to be um, part of that. So the beer goes out and gets sold in different uh, parts of New Zealand and uh, different outlets and. Uh, even one of the major breweries here in New Zealand is, because it's a brewing school, uh, one of the major brewers uh, have offered support and they help distribute the beer through some of their own outlets, which is very good. Ben, and just a, another question um, about science. As as There's a lot of arguments about we need to apply science to, to cure COVID. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. So at your school, what, what are some of the first um, – scientific measurements or tests that a student learns to do? What are you testing first? Are you testing malt? Are, are you testing sugar levels? And what are some equipment that or, or measuring devices that are used in basic brewing science? Well, some of the first things we teach the students actually don't even involve uh, any use of equipment. Some of the first things we teach them are the um, uh, how to read and understand the certificates of analysis, or COAs, as we call them here, um, on all the ingredients that uh, raw materials that we buy in, um, we have to keep uh, our records for uh, food, health, and safety. For you know, we have to have 
the certification on all the products uh, and batches of malt, for instance. So when a batch of malt arrives, a fresh batch of malt, on those certificates of analysis, it will give all the different things that the brewers need to know, all the information relating to the colour, uh, the moisture content of the grain, uh, the expected yield. Um, so they can learn, they can read a lot and help tweak a recipe just from reading that information because uh, as we explained to them quite early in the piece that just because we're buying batches of malt from the same supplier doesn't mean to say that <clears throat> two months later or a month later that type of malt is going to be exactly the same um, as the first first lot that was received. So in other words, um, there could be differences because of the growing conditions or climate or a number of reasons that the the malt producer has had to make some changes in his process or their process to produce as closely as they can to the specification required of that malt. So, but there could be slight variances. In other words, even just in the sense of there may be slightly yet less or slightly more, okay, in some cases, more yield for the same amount of barley or malt produced. So you may have to tweak your recipe formulation up or down um, to ensure that you're you're keeping consistency in your product. If you don't do that, of course, then your, your recipe or your beer could end up being a higher finishing gravity or a higher starting gravity and end up with more alcohol in it than you intended. And that gets that becomes problematic when you're trying to maintain a regular level with uh, customs and excise, so keeping the, the government happy with the taxes. Um, but that's just the simple things. Oh, yeah. And then, Todd, um, last thing, talking, we're getting more technical. We went from uh, check side pours and lagers. Um, w a guy like Ben, you know, an expert, a, a brewing instructor, w is there a question that you would ask? We're not going to have him answer it, but is there a question that's on your mind lately about anything that you're doing as a brewer that, that you need some help with? Um, so not necessarily – to that extent, but like, you know, Chris uh, and Ben, you have so much knowledge. I was uh, definitely flabbergasted and thanks for having me on the show with, you know, such great uh, brewing minds. I'm, you know, in awe of them for sure. Um, but anyway, so I've got a three vessel, uh, 10 barrel system and I've wanted to uh, do some decoction since we started and I have no idea how to like, do it with our setup, you know, and I've tried to figure everything out. And I had a pilot kit at my house for a while and uh, I was like, well, maybe I'll just bring it over. But, you know, even then it's not enough volume to like pull off and to do, like, I understand how to do it. I'm just trying to figure out like from an engineering standpoint, how do I use my three vessels to uh, do some decoction? Cause I mean, for us, or for, I should say for me again, being this old person in the brewing uh, part of good word, I am always chasing tradition and uh, I'm fascinated by decoction and I can't sell my system. And so I'm trying to figure out how in the fuck do I start doing decoction matches um, with my setup. And I don't know, Ben, maybe you can fly over to Georgia and uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me how to do it. Well, but. I'll tell you what, Todd, that's, that's going to be the next time we get you on the show. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Um, you, you keep, it's been great. We just met you uh, not too long ago. We did a show with in Atlanta and Buffalo, and we talked with you and, and Real Ale Sharpton and uh, Mike up at uh, Thin Man Brewing. So thanks again, man. And, and again, I really like this D called D Pilsner. And um, thanks to everybody. Big thanks to Ben Middlemiss. Big thanks to Chris Loring at Notch Brewing. Thanks to our uh, producer, Dylan Hoyer, engineer. I don't know if it's Amanda Wang or, or Matt Patterson, um, but thank you so much for joining us on Heritage Radio Network, and we'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right, guys. Woo! Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritageradionetwork. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization 
driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.